I would love to be able to open this to a board discussion. It's 9.20. Um, typically, we have to, uh, we end at 9.30 unless we vote to go further. But I uh, have really appreciated hearing these perspectives. We're starting to hear some common trends and common themes. So I think it would be very useful even for you all to hear a discussion uh, among us and know that this isn't anything that's being voted on tonight. This is uh, coming up as a uh, as an informational item for discussion. So I'd like to open it now for a uh, board discussion. And thank you very much. President Petrucci's, can I make a clarifying comment? Uh, yes. So um, before you is a revision to our current policy. Our current policy is 20 and under the emergency measures, um, uh, our previous chancellor, Claire, reduced that to 10. And after the emergency measures lifted, I did not reduce it to 10. Instead, I referred back to, to board policy because I have no authority to unilaterally change um, the board policy. So I just wanna be clear that what you're considering today is current board policy is 20 with the suggestion from DPGC to reduce that to 10 in a, in a permanent way. Mm -hmm. and, and then my suggestion not to reduce it, but to have more uh, flexible language, but that's what's before you today. Great, thank, thank, thank you, you so much for that clarification. Who among us would like to go first? Trustee Holliver. Well, uh, first, I really appreciate all the comments from people present and joining us by Zoom. And um, it's given me a lot to think about. Um, there are a couple of perspectives I think need to be added to this. I guess first I'd have a question uh, of staff. Have we um, done a survey of other community college districts to see what their policies are regarding minimum class size? If not, I would benefit, I don't know if other tr trustees would, but it would benefit me to see what our peers uh, have in place. And um, so that's a request. Um, a, a couple of comments, and I know some faculty uh, were here in 2010 when we were a revenue limit district, meaning our funding was entirely provided by the state of California. And we were uh, forced to cut um, our budget by 20% or more. And that put us, along with every district in the state, through uh, horrible decision making. Um, I recall, and perhaps uh, Executive Vice Chancellor would have better numbers on this, but we were told basically our break even to not go broke was about 32 students per class. Uh, or 35 students in that range. Now, what's missing in this conversation is an understanding of how uh, community colleges are funded. It is true. We are in remarkably very good shape right now. And we are also uh, prioritizing enrollment recovery, which um, I think allows us on a ad hoc basis as we examine our numbers and our trends and our finances to continue to you know, waive the, the 20 student uh, minimum class requirement. And I, I believe at least for, uh, for the you know, foreseeable future that that policy makes sense because our, I think among our top priorities is boosting enrollment. And one way you boost enrollment is by reducing class size, which we have done. And I think that makes a lot of sense going forward. My concern would be with making this uh, enshrined as a permanent policy um, because um, times and financial conditions change. And I think one thing that is lacking in this is that um, in number three, that this needs to be done in a fiscally responsible manner. So we're balancing uh, the waiver, so to speak, of the uh, minimum class size with all of these positive goals, but balancing it against our ability to, to pay for it. So um, that's where I'm, my thinking is right now. Other board members? 
Yes, Trustee, you can go now. Yeah, um, I've been listening very intently um, about what the, the change or this uh, proposed return to the old, to our former policy would do. And it looks like a couple of things kind of come out to me. The first thing I think is that it seems that there'd be a disproportionate effect on certain learning communities that have been articulated today that may or may not have been taken into effect at the time that or at, at this time when we're trying to actually determine whether or not we should go back to that policy. I think there's a, a couple of things that shade into that. And that is that if, if we are looking at trying to increase um, our, our uh, enrollment, this would not be an opportune time for us to make this kind of a move. I think it would have a deleterious effect. Well, at least a lot of the people here that have that have come out to to make their their voices known and and shown their opinions. Um, I can tell you from personal um, uh, from a personal uh, experience that my son, um, when he graduated from Reardon in 2017, went to SF State for one semester, and um, was not prepared for that college experience. And uh, at my suggestion, enrolled at Skyline. And was embraced by the cipher and Kababayan programs uh -huh. and wow. was and actually he's still there so he's still, <laughs> he was actually in in heather's uh, in the play the other or last last month but the fact is is that is that from my perspective i think that my job here is to kind of give voice to people that don't have a voice mm -hmm. and to articulate those things that i think are important. I think that our, our main charge here is to do things is to do no harm. Right. And I think that, that, that if we were to go back to that policy, that what I'm hearing is that classes would be canceled and, you know, it may affect people in a negative way, our, our students and our constituency. And I think that if we're going to do things that there's got to be a better payoff than saving money yeah um Thank you. so i think that i, I and, and again it's it, it's this is not a i'm always going to somewhat be consistent in the sense that whenever i i hear that we may not have taken into account the effects that we do to to different learning communities i think we should take that into account because it may not affect other other communities but it does affect um a community that 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 has been our, that has articulated their, their uh, opinions, you know, and I, and I, I think that, that the more, deeper than that, I think is, is that, that we have an understanding of what our job is and what an understanding of, of, of how we're, you know, taking into account what the DPGC, what their job is and how we're to yeah, take yeah. their recommendations. Uh, you know, if, if, if I'm being told by a group of peers or people that are that that are at least closer to the the action than I am, then I'm either going to trust what they have to say and take into account and use it as a factor to decide to make the decision, or I'm going to hear something to the contrary that's going to show me that, and I'd be able to have to explain to you why I don't agree with you, and I'd have to be convinced to the contrary, and. Quite frankly, at this juncture, I, I'm not convinced to the contrary that it would be in our best interest to revert back to our previous policy. Thank you. That's about all I have to say on that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, student trustee Ta. Hi. <clears throat> so um, I just wanted to reiterate um, what I've already um, provided the board, I rem want to remind you, and some of the board members were not here when I brought forth the survey, that um, I surveyed our students last summer. Um, and I wanna remind you that 22% of our students have experienced a class cancellation as of last summer that responded to, our, um, to my uh, survey. And I also asked the students if they agreed with the policy of 20 students and 82.1% said, no, they do not agree. Wow. Wow. I wanted to provide um, a reminder. I'm gonna actually, I'll drop this um, in the chat. So all of the board members have access to it and I'll make sure that Candace gets, um, gets it emailed or I can email it out to everybody as well. 
um, it has specific student comments um, of that call out our underserved students and how they're impacted by cancel, canceled class. Mm -hmm. So I wanna remind you of that. I'm not gonna go into detail right now about that because I have other things I would like to say about this. So I also wanted to provide context that I just, we had a, um, a great discussion in district student council regarding this, and we did vote to, um, to support district participatory governance councils recommendation of 10 students. So the students are fully on the side of keeping it at 10. Um, I wanted to, I had a, a healthy conversation with Dr. Marino um, in our preparation um, for the board. Um, and I wanted to raise some concerns that I have thought about since then. Um, so she did um, tell me, you know, that, you know, her intention with um, keeping it at 20 is not that classes are going to be canceled between 10 and 20, but she wants to, wants to reach for that goal. Um, and then she also said um, that I'm paraphrasing. So um, forgive me if I don't get every word correctly. Um, but so my understanding of our conversation is that the number three is to show that um, uh, her intent is not to have those classes canceled and have to have a healthy conversation with the deans about not canceling classes that have at least 10 students in them. My concern is that our, it, it's two parts. One, Chancellor Reno, although I, I hope that she like moves on and um, does a great job in the chancellor position and maybe she will be hired as a the full-time chancellor, but she's an intern right now. So we don't know who is going to be in that seat in a year. And to me, if we're not putting it on paper, there's a possibility that the next chancellor will see it differently. Mm. The second part um, to that is, um, I think it's really important if we're about anti-racism, if we're about social justice, yes. it's really important equity. It's really important. A part of that is putting on paper what we say we're gonna do. So I think it's really important that if we say we're not gonna cancel classes that have at least 10 students in them, we need to put that on paper. Exactly. We That's need to, right. to take away the fear from students, from faculty, that is, it's not needed. It's not needed. We don't need to pretend like we're going to, to make it to 20. Yes, let's say we're going to have a goal of 20. We can have that healthy goal. We know we want to increase enrollment, but it doesn't mean that we're there right now. Mm -hmm. So um, this, there's another part to this that I would like to make sure that um, I have voiced while I'm still here in this seat. Um, so point four um, is if this policy gets passed, regardless of the, um, the policy that gets passed, whether it's Chancellor Marino's or um, district participatory governance, it is all asking, um, it is asking that all of the colleges um, provide a, um, a cancellation policy. So transparency on how the classes get canceled to be put through a stakeholder process. Mm -hmm. So I know that she did provide these on um, as a link on the website, but I, there's nothing showing me that these have gone through stakeholder pro processes. So if yeah. this gets passed, yeah. I would like to ask the, the presidents of the schools to make sure that this policy gets put through participatory governance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any comments? Uh, I, I guess I, I have one question and one comment on uh, on the write up that was in the board package uh, for course cancellation trends. If I'm reading, I want to make sure I'm reading the table correctly. In the fall of 2022, we had uh, eight course cancellations uh, between for classes that were between 10 and 19 students. Do I have that right? This is table one of the board packet on course cancellation trends. Page one of the attachment. Dr. McVean, he's he's responding There's, in the affirmative. Yeah, I just want to make sure I'm reading that right. So this, um, what hangs in the balance is eight classes, I guess. I want to make sure I understand that. I've got it wrong. Okay. Can someone explain table one to me? <laughs> uh, 
Sure. So, so you're referencing uh, table one on, on, on page one of the report included. Um, this showed the, the number of canceled classes at each band. And so uh, during uh, spring 2022, um, we still had a, a reduction of the minimum cancellation to 10. And so classes weren't being canceled if they achieved an enrollment of 10. Um, and so at that time, you, you had three cancellations in those bands and uh, 215 cancellations below 10. Got it. Thank you. Uh, um, and then second question, uh, if I'm understanding the next table in terms of cost, uh, well, I guess you've answered it. That it doesn't. You're not. We're not talking about a situation where the policy is restored and classes are being canceled. Here, where classes uh, are being kept. So, in the way the board policy is written, there's discretion that resides with the dean and or the president. Yeah. Is that correct? I the dis discretion with the deans. Yes. Got it. And what I heard throughout the um, throughout the COVID uh, challenge was a lack of consistency in understanding how classes got canceled and when. And I recognized that that was a crazy time. Um, uh, and we were all doing our best to work it out, but I very much would support as we approach this policy, having clarity around the process and the timing. Um, uh, and I really like the idea, uh, uh, Trustee Ta uh, added of having the actual visibility of the number of uh, uh, enrollees real time in the uh, system so that we can, so students can see it. So you can see whether you're at risk or whether you're close to having a class go. So um, I would just encourage that whatever our policy is, it include as much transparency and predictability into the process for how classes um, uh, are considered for cancellation. Thanks. Yes, Trustee Ta. Oh, I do have one more point um, in regards. Thank you for bringing this up, Trustee um, Pimentel, because I did want to point out that the amount of money. Um, so one of the things that Chancellor Marino, um, that you had said something about, like, I, I want I want to paraphrase. I'm not remember exactly the words you said. We're going to go broke if we take it down to 10 and keep it at 10. I don't see how we can go broke um, because. The, between the 10 and the 20, like we're talking about a couple hundred thousand dollars. If we look back to fall 2018, spring 2019, they all are not really going over like what, $400,000? Don't we make $3 million off of our international students? And that was before we raised it. Can't we use that funds to fill that gap? And I'm sorry, I don't mean to like rally everybody up, but this is a serious <laughs> conversation. This is, no, I'm serious. This is really a serious conversation. Why can't we use funds that we have to fill like, you know, this, this gap? It's not that big of a gap. I don't see how we can go broke doing this. Well, I mean, I appreciate you so much, Leslie. And I think our conversation was really about what my considerations were long-term. And um, I, I'm personally appreciating this room and this conversation and the board's interaction and, and the faculty and student input. And um, and this is this is a board's decision, and so um, my point was, we have to do all of these things and be fiscally responsible in the long in the long term. And so um, I'm open. I think we're all open. The staff is open to guidance from this board, and um, I love the idea that we have guidance on what the board is comfortable with doing either temporary for the next year. Um, and as you all know, I don't have any authority to unilaterally change the policy. And, and the reason I'm bringing it now is because you can feel the pressure for an answer. And I think what we wanna bring in June is, a, is clear, a clear answer at least for how we move forward in the next year. Okay, so I'm last. <laughs> Thank you, Trustee. Uh, and I think it's, uh, you know, remembering when I was a student, um, yeah, trying to get classes, but then those days it wasn't as hard to get classes. Um, so I do think that we, what we can do to provide some sort of uh, reassurance or um, let students know that the class is going to be endangered of, uh, of not um, 
being closed or not needs to be done. And um, because some of those also are required courses, I guess, some prerequisites, and those are really the critical ones. It's, it seems to me even a discussion here that it's not a one size fit all, and we shouldn't treat it as a one size fit all. So certain courses should have more weight than other courses in terms of impact. You know, is it a, uh, is it a, a very critical and but a small number of, of people and is it going to impact more or less uh, students? Um, I do have a question though. Uh, so on this table, financial impact reducing minimum class size, class size for less than 10 is almost a million, nine, $956,000 in, is that co lost cost? Is that what it means? That cost of, uh, <laughs> if, if <laughs> when those classes are filled or being, are being taught or what's that mean? Sure. Thank you, Trustee Lee, for the question. Um, so so uh, what that table was showing and was referenced by a couple of folks is what would have been the cost if sections that were canceled in those levels had actually uh, ran. And so while uh, our policy has never indicated that classes below 10 won't be canceled, um, we just provided that information of this is what it would look like for the different classes that had been canceled. So the more pertinent to the discussion of this policy is the ban between uh, 10 and 20. And so going back pre-pandemic, looking at the classes from 10 to 15, 16 to 19, you're looking at somewhere around 325 to $200,000, depending on the term that sections canceled in those bans would have cost if they had been run. And so if there's a, a hard minimum at 10, you would look at incurring those costs potentially moving forward if you were expanding sections. It was just a perspective on what classes that were canceled would have cost if they had been run. Okay, so I think um, I think the solution to many of these things, and when I was at the city council level, was increasing the size of the pot. So we have a we have a finite size pot of money, and we can only spend so much money. So you know, then it becomes a matter of priority. And I think, you know, we got, we can't be lazy about this. We have to figure out which, which classes, you know, we, we can go below 10, which classes we, we cannot go below 10, that sort of thing. But I think a solution, also a great solution would be if you increase the size of our pot somehow. So, uh, and then that would afford us a lot of opportunity, other opportunities. So let's put that food for thought. And that's all part of the increase the enrollment thing, right? So um, I think that success breeds uh, more success. So I think that's what we strive for with the help of our, the people who we serve, the students, right? So um, if we could, uh, if we just, we look at the bigger picture as well, but I can't guarantee that everybody's gonna be happy, but I think that we should try to strive to not make it a one size fit all. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, well, I'd like to make a few comments and then we're going to have to take a vote about going later or not. Um, I really agree with uh, my colleagues here on several points. And I know um, that, well, and I have some pragmatic questions too. So our current board policy is 20. Um, when did the 10 expire? Was that when the emergency measures stopped? And is it, is, uh, yeah, was that November? When was that exactly? I'm just curious. So I think um, uh, our previous chancellor, Claire, um, uh, created an exception for 10 through summer. So we're under pressure summer. for got it, fall. Got it. Okay, got it. Yeah, that, that's what I was wondering about. Um, I, like Trustee Holliber, sort of want a bit more data. I'm curious what the other community colleges, um, a little research. It, it, it's hard to tell just from uh, just from doing some research about minimum class size requirements. So I think it would be really good just to kind of understand what is, what is uh, the norm and we can certainly get some of that kind of benchmark data. So that would be a request that I would have. Um, I do remember during the middle of this time when, uh, you know, it was, coming back for the first time in the hybrid and, and how stressful 
the inconsistency of applying rules of what could be canceled and what couldn't and was it was just very ambiguous and um and, and how frustrating that was for everybody and for students um and so some of the language even the modif the modifying language and even the original board policy uh i just think it wouldn't it, it no matter what it ends up being whether it's a 10 20 or if there's gradations of why a class can be offered or not offered uh between a certain size really needs to be specified um you know set things like you know, will normally not be canceled. You know, what does that mean? Um, and I would really like to see articulated those things that are that make the biggest difference for students. And I know there's some of that data. I would I would love to spend more time with that data, probably not tonight, but even some additional data to understand students who didn't get that course that was canceled that semester. I think if I read the numbers correctly, it's something like 86% of them still found that class the following semester. So really trying to get an understanding of the whole student experience, whether it's over a, you know, a year or two years, what does that look like? Um, courses, sequential courses, um, single sections of courses that are only offered um, that, you know, that, that build on each other. Obviously those are a priority. Um, issues around um, equity and achievement gaps. Again, specify what do, what are those things? What do they look like? I think just saying that we'll look at these isn't enough, that we really would have to um, articulate that. And I really like student trustee Ta's you know, comment as well as how we need policies from college to college and or maybe their district policies or whatever that whatever that sort of shared governance model is going to be in terms of what that looks like, because uh, that's the last thing we want is, is I think what we experienced and in a very chaotic time, everybody doing the best they can around being fully remote and then hybrid. Um, but what, you know, what does that look like and, and when? I mean, I, I, I'm confident that we could do that, but I, I know that we didn't, you know, we were running as fast as we could to try to make things work in those last couple of years. Um, yeah, so the so the discretion not being consistent, um, and I'm I'm nervous about this try about getting all this data before our next meeting in June, which is what I think you were hoping for. So I'm I'm wondering how much progress we can make, uh, uh, and sort of answering some of those questions and and really understanding the student from the whole student experience of like what happened with those students. I'm hearing a lot of stories about. You know, did students drop out if they couldn't get their courses? Did they go to another campus if they couldn't get like, what do those numbers really look like? Because uh, I think even, I mean, obviously that we want to be, um, you know, financially, I forgot the word that somebody used, but, you know, mindful of what that looks like. Maybe there's a lot of courses that are have seven students in them that should not be canceled. What are those criteria and what do those look like? And maybe it isn't, uh, like you said, um, Trustee Lee, maybe it's not a one size fits all. Uh, we have to really look across the board at that and its impact on, on, again, the whole student pathway of whatever that certificate or degree is that they're pursuing. Um, so I know that Kate Brown wanted to say a few words. I think we need to give her an opportunity to speak. But what, what I'd like to say is that um, this sounds like this could also be a great study session for something like in August or November, but we need a decision. I think the reason we wanted to bring it no later than June was so that we could communicate out to campus mm -hmm. what they need. So at least at a minimum, we would need to communicate out something that tides us over to mm -hmm. spring. Mm -hmm. And then we do a deep dive. We already have a ton of data. We can get the more data and then bring it as a study session and make a a very mindful uh, decision as a board. Yeah, I think that that's probably going to be the most reasonable uh, course forward. Um, but that will, of course, be open to the board. Yes, Trustee Oliver. I'd like to add one more data request. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, you know, I think a lot of the commentary was really focused on um, in person, on campus mm -hmm, classes, mm -hmm. which um, I have a lot of sympathy for for you know those remarks because bringing students back to campus uh, I believe is crucial. So I think it would be helpful if we could look at 
what the record has been on um, enrollment for in-person versus hybrid or remote classes, maybe disaggregate that data. In and terms perhaps, of cancellations, you mean? Or, uh, in yeah. terms of, you know, how many students were in classes that got canceled, but mm -hmm. also didn't get canceled. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what were the average class sizes on campus versus, mm -hmm. um, you know, remote or hybrid? And maybe consider splitting this into two buckets with different, uh, you know, different standards. So uh, that data would be helpful. Absolutely. Yes. Trustee Ta. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to make uh, another request. So one of I just wanted to ping off of what you had um, asked for, um, and in regards to Arthur's um, comments. Um, so not only did how you know how they were how the students like maybe found another class the next semester, but also did it impact how long it took them to transfer or finish their degree? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and then um, I just wanted to make a note to make everyone aware because there's been some conversation about this and I'm not sure if everyone noted that in the the policy um, that DPCG recommended part two um, actually does say that we need to carefully consider any um, classes under 10 and it needs to be in con um, consultation with a faculty so it's something that there is room to make sure that we're not canceling classes that we students really need even under 10 thanks thank you well, I think we have our, our marching orders. Um, okay, I'm sorry, yes, Kate. I think I, think I need a turn. Um, this is good trouble. This is good trouble. This is us, and I'm really glad that you had an opportunity, all of us had an opportunity to listen to each other. Um, number one, um, district participatory, the district participatory, Governance Council is participatory governance, and I think that their recommendations need to be taken seriously. We do three readings of the board policy. We get the, the council, it's the, the committee itself discusses it, one. Then they take it to their constituents, two. Then it comes back for a third reading. So I just, I, I, I feel like it's really important to say that. The second thing that I listen to is that the academic senate of the community colleges of the state is really concerned about enrollment and is really concerned about attracting and retaining students. So that's all the community colleges in the state of California. I think if you do some data looking, you better be sure to be looking at the community supported districts, not just any community college, because we're spent. We're special, we matter, and there's some things that we can do that other colleges can't, that, are that we couldn't do when we were revenue limit. I do remember those times. And the third thing is the student concerns are all of our concerns. And it's these, uh, this idea about the face-to-face -face classes that are the cells and the smaller classes are these face-to-face -face classes really needs to be taken into consideration. Um, small classes, are the best learning and probably are the strongest retention. They're not the only kind of classes we'll ever teach. A lot of us, all of a sudden, I have a summer school class of 36. Okay, okay, I can do 36. I might do a better job with 26, but I can do 36, <laughs> especially if it helps another class that's at 12. Yeah. So I just think that it's it's time to, this is time to build classes and build trust with our students. And that if we, if, if we don't do that, the concerns that all of you have described about enrollment, I think will go south. And that's not what you want either. That's enough. Great, thank you very much. So unless there's any other comments uh, from the board, I think we'll, we have some direction that we have given to you. And um, I think, again, had a very valuable discussion to, uh, to understand the issues and that we're not there yet. I think there's more to understand. So, um, okay.